Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my review of The Early Asimov Volume 3 by Isaac Asimov. So this is actually the third of three sort of shorter paperback books. They were also published just in one edition for hardback. I think it was just to do with the time, it would be in the 70s. I don't know whether it was cheaper or easier or whatever, it was just more mass market as well. Uh, but yeah, basically these three different books, uh, and I think I have reviewed both of the previous ones, they bring together a bunch of Asimov's early work, and as is fairly common with his short story collections, he also writes little introductory essays to each of the pieces, just um, really covering like where the idea came from, a bit of the publishing history as well, and just taking you behind the scenes, which I think is quite cool. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Asimov's first orbit. In the late 1930s, a new young talent began to make his mark on the science fiction scene with a succession of outstanding stories in the various SF magazines of the time. His name? Isaac Asimov. He was later to become world-renowned as the author of such classics of modern science fiction as the epic Foundation Trilogy and the Robot Stories in which he formulated the now famous Three Laws of Robotics. The early Asimov, published in three volumes in Panther Science Fiction, is an unsurpassed showcase of the storytelling brilliance of the young Asimov. Each story is prefaced by Dr. Asimov with fascinating biographical details of how and when he came to write it, as well as his own critical evaluation of it. The result is a doubly rich science fiction treat, a collection of tales that makes engrossing entertainment in its own right and, in addition, gives the reader a first-hand look at the development of the 20th century's undisputed grandmaster of science fiction. So we're going to start here with author, author which is, I guess, his equivalent of, like, Misery by Stephen King. It very much uh, analyzes what it's like to be a writer. So uh, we're learning about Graham Dawn, the author here. It says, uh, Graham decided to pass a stern, lonely, womanless life and to have nothing but villainesses in his stories forever after. He was answering in monosyllables, alternating yeses and noes. Yes, he did take cocaine on occasion. He found it helped the creative urge. No, he didn't think he could allow Hollywood to take over to Meister. He thought movies weren't true expressions of real art. Besides, they were just a passing fad. Yes, he would read Miss Crumb's manuscripts if she brought them, only too glad to. Reading amateur manuscripts was such fun, and editors are really such brutes. Yeah, we all know that's a lie. Okay, so then his character shows up, and that then made me think of The Dark Half by Stephen King. Although, obviously, the, this, these stories predate that. And then we get this, this sort of situation where the press and the public kind of believe that he's the Watson for this character he's created uh, and that he's like the chronicler of him, when obviously really he just made the guy up. So we have a lot that take the form of like reports and one that's like the form of a bunch of um, like official letters, Blind Alley, and he says, um, I just thought this bit, um, there are a few bits here of his accompanying essay I want to read out. Uh, the letters that form a major part of this story, which contains one of my rare examples of extraterrestrial intelligences, are, you will be glad to know, based on the kind of material that routinely passed in and out of the NAES, and, for all I know, still does. The turgid style is not my invention. I couldn't invent it if I tried. When the story appeared, L. Sprague de Camp happily pointed out one flaw in the letter style. I had, I had carelessly made someone in lower position who was addressing someone in higher position say it is requested instead of it is suggested. The underling can humbly suggest, but only an overling can harshly request. Then he talks a bit about Groff Cronklin, who is an editor who has just one of the best names ever. And then uh, some historical context here. Um, on, May, on May the 8th, 1945, one week before the mule was completed, the war ended in Europe. Naturally, there was at once a move to demobilise as many of the men who had been fighting in Europe as possible, and to draft replacements from among those who had luxuriated at home. All through the war, till then, I had been receiving regular draft deferments as a research chemist working in a position important to the war effort. Periodically, there were revisions of the draft rules, and it was a rare month in which it did not look at one time or another as though I might be drafted. It kept me on my toes, I can tell you, but I did not feel particularly ill-used. My predominant feeling was that of a sneaking guilt at not being drafted, and some shame that I was relieved at my deferment. During 1944, the uncertainty went so far that I was called in for a physical examination, and it at once turned out that my nearsightedness was so bad as to render me ineligible for the draft anyway. After VE Day, the Navy Yard was ordered to retain only some percentage of those of its deferred employees, allowing the remainder to be drafted. Presumably, the Navy Yard would select its most important employees to keep, but they knew a better trick 
according to the tale we employees heard. They retained all draftable employees who met the physical requirements and removed protection from those who did not meet them either because of age or physical defect. In this way, they hoped to keep them all. Those who were fit because they were declared necessary and those, were, and those who were over age or unfit because they were over age or unfit. I, as an unfit employee, was one of those declared non-essential. And then, you guessed it, the army lowered its physical requirements. The result that those Navy Yard employees with bad eyes or other mild deficiencies were put in imminent peril of the draft, while others, who were in every way equivalent except that they were in good shape, were not. You may well laugh. And uh, so this is interesting. It says that naturally it was slow work. I didn't finish first draft till February 17th. And then everything came to a halt when the very next day I discovered that I would be among those sent out to the South Pacific to participate in Operation Crossroads. This was the first post-war atom bomb test on the island of Bikini, which later gave its name to a bathing suit so skimpy as to react on the male constitution, in theory, like an atom bomb. The fact that a week later I received my check for the anthologization of Blind Alley did little to raise my spirit. There's a little mention he sold one of his film scripts to Orson Welles, although nothing came of it, sadly. So I thought this was interesting and kind of philosophical, and also true though, you know. Um, the administrator of the Red River Guru Grouping held a position in no way different in essentials from that of the museum curator, the recorder, or any other voluntary job holder. To expect a difference is to assume a society in which executive ability is rare. Actually, all jobs in a guru grouping, where a job is defined as regular work, the fruits of which are dear to others in addition to the worker himself, are divided into two classes, one voluntary jobs and the other involuntary or community jobs. All of the first classification are equal. If a guru enjoys the digging of useful ditches, his bent is to be respected and his job to be honoured. If no one enjoys such burrowing and yet it is found necessary for comfort, it becomes a community job, done by lot or rotation according to convenience. Annoying, but unavoidable. So then we get this piece here. Uh, this is called The Endochronic Properties of Resublimated Thiotomaline. And this has like scientific diagrams and stuff. It takes the form essentially of a research paper. It was very slow reading. Uh, so I thought I didn't really much enjoy the story, but his notes on it were quite interesting. Uh, so he says, although thiotomaline appeared in Astounding, as did all my stories at the time, it received circulation far outside the ordinary science fiction world. It passed from chemist to chemist by way of the magazine itself, or by reprints in small trade journals, or by copies pirated and mimeographed, even by word of mouth. People who had never heard of me at all as a science fiction writer heard of thiotomaline. It was the very first time my fame transcended the field. What's more, although thiotomaline was essentially a work of fantasy, the form was that of non-fiction. Viewed from that standpoint, thiotomaline was the first piece of non-fiction I had ever published professionally, the harbinger of a vast amount to come. But what amused me most was that a surprising number of readers actually took the article seriously. I was told that in the weeks after its appearance, the librarians at the New York Public Library were driven out of their minds by hordes of eager youngsters who demanded to see copies of the fake journals I had used as pseudo-references. And I imagine he took great joy in that as well. I would. We get a little conversation about uh, tobacco here, space, space tobacco. I notice you're smoking earth-grown tobacco. A habit I can break if I have to. Probably by giving up smoking. I wouldn't use outer world tobacco for anything but killing mosquitoes. This is the kind of mistake that I make in my writing and uh, this shows the importance of having a good editor. Shout out to Pamelise Harris, my editor. And he says, One thing about the story that I can't explain is the fact that I have two characters in it, one of whom is named Moreno and one Marino. I haven't the slightest idea why I use such similar names. There was no significance in it, I assure you. Only carelessness. There was also a Maynard. And then uh, here's how the book ends and I think it's rather fitting so I'm going to read that out to you guys. With all this taken into account, it is not surprising that my earnings as a writer began to rise rapidly almost as soon as I came to Boston. By 1952 I was making considerably more money as a writer than as a professor, and the discrepancy grew larger in favour of writing each succeeding year. By 1957 I decided, still somewhat to my surprise, that I had been a writer all along, and that that was all I was. On July the 1st, 1958, I gave up my salary and my duties, but, with the agreement of the school, kept my title which was then Associate Professor of Biochemistry. I keep that title to this day. I give an occasional lecture at the school when asked to do so, and I also lecture elsewhere when asked to do so, and charge a fee. For the rest, I became a full-time freelance writer, which is what I do. 
Writing is easy now and is ever more satisfying. I keep what amounts to a 70 hour week, which is what I do, if you count all the ancillary jobs of proofreading, indexing, research and so on. I average 7 or 8 books a year, and this book, The Early Asimov, is my 125th book. And yet I must admit that there has never been, since 1949, anything like the real excitement of those first 11 Campbell years, when I wrote only in my spare time, and sometimes not even then, when every submission meant unbearable suspense, when every rejection meant misery, and every acceptance ecstasy, and every $50 check was the wealth of Croesus. And on July the 11th, 1971, John Campbell, at the still early age of 61, while watching television, died at 7.30pm, quietly and peacefully, without any pain at all. There is, no way at all. there is no way at all to express how much he meant to me, and how much he did for me, except, perhaps, to write these books evoking once more those days of a quarter century ago. So overall, I did enjoy the early Asimov Volume 3. I guess my problem with this is that the first volume really felt like the early Asimov, but by this point he's writing this stuff in between writing things like the Positronic Robots books, which he's really well known for. And so it's kind of as though you're just, it's not really early Asimov anymore, it's just Asimov in his glory days, except you're not reading the glory days stories, so I don't know. But I'm a completionist and I'm, I'm glad I read them. I could have probably done without the one that was formatted as a scientific report or the one that was a series of like written reports as well but I mean I'll read anything that Asimov wrote and that's actually eventually the plan so overall I gave this one a 3.5 out of 5 so there we have it that's what I made of the early Asimov volume 3 by Isaac Asimov as always don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book if you read it in the comments hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot Bye bye